Hello and welcome to another ACCE LN Hangout and this time with a focus on girls and STEM. G'day Amanda. G'day Roland. And it's a place where we can share our learning and teaching adventures and dream about our future professional learning adventures. <laughs> and as usual, if you're watching us live, then you can post a question to the panel by going to todaysmeet.com forward slash A-C-C-E-L-N. And on Twitter, you can use the hashtag A-C-C-E-L-N. And if you're already on our YouTube channel, well, you can just write a comment there and one day we'll sort out our life and streamline our conversations, but we like multitasking. Uh, we like to live a dangerous life. I'm Roland Guesthausen, a teacher from down south in Australia, below the Tropic of Capricorn, slightly under the snow line and the washing that are drying here. Um, I'm a full-time teacher, part-time staff fleet officer, and NASA wannabe. And I'm Amanda Revlin, an e-learning coordinator from Brisbane, proud QSite member. I also teach Year 7s how to use, um, how to code and do digital tech stuff, or as I like to say, computer science. Um, I'm a girl and just like many other girls I like making, inventing and coding and I wish I'd actually been able to do that even more as a student. Now we're honoured to have with us some very special guests including QSite icon Lindy hi, and Karen Peterson from the National Girls Collaborative Project and we'll actually ask everyone on our panel this evening to say a quick hello. We'll get the boys out of the way first so Dr Jason Zagami Please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Sagami from Griffith University, um, involved in all things educational technology wise. Nice summary. And our very special guest, Karen, who has been touring all around Australia, didn't have to wake up early US time today to join us. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Karen Peterson with the National Girls Collaborative Project and I'm very excited to be here. And share some information with all of you around what we've been doing in the States with collaboration in Girls in STEM. I'm looking forward to hearing all about it. Lindy. Hi everyone, I'm Lindy Orwin and I work at USQ and I'm a research uh, fellow in the field of STEAM ed in education with remote access technologies. Sounds very exciting and I believe um, you're part of the reason we have Karen here with us and you've been helping be her tour guide manager as well. Now we have a first here tonight and we have the lovely Sue and Sue has a whiteboard this evening. What are you going to do with that Sue? Well Amanda, I'm going to be graphically recording what is actually happening today. I'm going to provide a visual story of Karen's wonderful presentation on our hangout tonight. That's very exciting. And Dr. Susie Starfish, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, so I'm a marine ecologist or a marine scientist, um, have been for many, many years. I love the ocean, um, but I'm also an artist and a graphic recorder. And as my alter ego, Dr. Susie Starfish on Facebook, um, I go into schools and groups of children um, and adults, by the way, who love the ocean and talk about the art of science for our oceans. Fabulous. So as Roland said in our introduction tonight, we're exploring our futures in science, technology, engineering and mathematics with a focus on encouraging girls to participate in these areas. Um, Karen, um, you're in Australia right now and you're promoting the work in this field. What's the future like for girls in STEM? How can we encourage them to be more involved? Well, the future is bright for girls in STEM because there's so many opportunities and so many amazing programs. However, we have to encourage girls to really become more self-confident and more resilient, right? Because the research says that girls are just as competent as boys in STEM, but they're not as interested. They don't feel confident. So the, the good news is there's so many amazing programs, so much work that's available for girls to get involved in. You just have to encourage them. We've got to engage them. How would you go about encouraging girls uh, to become more involved in STEM? I mean, what are the kind of things that girls would be looking for that would motivate them to choose a, uh, a STEM career? Well, I, you know, I actually have something I'd like to share with everybody in a presentation, the Sci Girl 7. Do you think we could flip to that and 
I could talk a little bit about some of the great strategies that engage girls in STEM. Absolutely, that sounds fabulous. All right. Well, miss your beautiful face, so keep bringing it back again. <laughs> I will. Uh, let's see. Here we go. And while Karen's uh, flicking across to the uh, screencast, we're just having a look at Sue, who's now happily colouring in the dots. <laughs> and just by way of information, I guess, whilst the uh, Karen and Sue are getting ready, um, Years ago, my first degree was biochemistry, and I got a marine biology certification, um, which is good for the occasional trivial pursuit question, I guess, uh, Sue, like uh, how many legs and appendages does a squid have and, or an octopus? Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> how are you going there, Karen? I'm, I'm ready. Can you, did I do that correctly or not? Did I we not can do that still we can still see your lovely face, so if you want to jump oh. back into the Hangout window, oh you can do the screen share. We practice it like four times. It's just whenever you're live that these things happen. Of course. Ah, okay. Magic. There we go. There Yay. we go. How about that? Okay. Great. Looks good. Great. So I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Sci Girls 7. Uh, the Sci Girls is a PBS television show that I've been a part of for the last four years. We're actually filming season four. Uh, the very exciting thing about Sci Girls is that we won an Emmy for uh, season two. And the idea behind Sci Girls is that real girls are doing real STEM projects with the help of a mentor. And then there's an animated character, Izzy, you can see her down uh, on this screen. And she uh, jumps in from time to time with her best friend, Jake, and helps the girls solve problems. And so from this uh, television show, we've created a number of activities uh, and information that's all free online. For educators, and we've created the Sci Girls Seven, and these are strategies that engage girls in STEM. And so, I'm just going to go through these quickly. I'll pause if there are any questions, but I, I think they answer that question that you asked, right? How can we engage girls in STEM? Uh, and all of these strategies are based on research uh, that we've done over the last few years. So, one of these strategies is that girls really benefit from collaboration especially when they can participate and communicate fairly. And I've got on this slide some of the ways that you can encourage girls to collaborate by having them work in small groups um, and creating a community atmosphere that's open and positive. Another way that girls are motivated uh, are by projects that they find personally relevant and meaningful. And, you know, this strategy uh, I think applies to everybody, right? We all are more interested when we're doing something that's personally relevant to, our, to us and meaningful. And so one of the ways that educators can utilize this strategy is to, to talk about their own enthusiasm and how they, get, they got interested in whatever they're doing personally. And also to think about what, why do kids need to know this information, right? Um, and think about that key uh, piece of information that you're providing and make sure that it's really relevant. And then using case studies and stories as well. One of the things that I wanted to mention about these strategies is that even though these strategies engage girls, they're also good teaching strategies for boys. And I'm sure all of you are seasoned educators and you recognize these as great teaching strategies. Girls enjoy open, hands-on open-ended projects and investigations. And so I've got some suggestions here for when you're thinking about uh, how to present an activity that maybe you don't provide a step-by-step -step direction and really preventing that you know, urge to intervene, especially when a young girl asks you, is this right or how do I do this, to really encourage that girl to um, research it on her own, figure out, figure, work on it on her own. Um, and you might suggest approaches to a problem, but you really don't want to provide the answer. So that question, is this right? You know, another way of answering that is, well, you know, what are some other ways to deal with this? Uh, girls are motivated when they can approach projects in their own way, applying their creativity and unique talents and preferred learning styles. Um, and we talked quite a bit about this in a workshop that I led today, that it's difficult often where the 
educators, we're the teachers, we're the leaders in a classroom. But acting as a facilitator rather than an expert can be something that helps encourage girls to consider science and technology and engineering and math. I've got a couple of other suggestions on here. One is allowing communication in a variety of ways, maybe with poetry or music or posters. So, as I said earlier, we know that girls and boys are equally competent in STEM, but it's really the confidence uh, that is an issue for girls. Girls especially um, want to do things right and correct the first way. And so if they fail, it's difficult to re-engage them. Um, and so rewarding success publicly and immediately, um, respecting uh, the, your, the girls in your classroom, providing um, equal feedback, and being careful about saying things like, you are really good at this. Because mm -hmm. even though that may feel like something positive, it sends a message that it's natural and that there wasn't any effort uh, that was put into that. Um, and letting girls know that you believe that they can improve and succeed over time and that skills can be improved with practice. Karen, one of the things I, I hear quite regularly is um, the idea that um, you know these types of subject areas aren't really suited for girls. Is there um, in terms of the, the confidence, you know, is there something that we actually um, unintentionally create through a range of different mes messages for girls that you kind of feel we have to undo those messages in order to, um, or get to the girls before um, they hear those messages in order to um, give them that extra confidence? Yes, well, um, actually stereotypes, I think that's one of the things that you're referring to. You know, it's a problem throughout our culture, right? I often do an exercise with birthday cards. And if you look at birthday cards for boys versus birthday cards for girls, you'll see that, you know, many of the boys' birthday cards are very action-oriented, right? Um, yeah. And the girls' birthday cards may have lovely fairies. Have a sweet birthday. You're a princess. That's right. And and so thinking about how we can encourage girls to be strong and, and be bold. And you know, it's difficult to uh, address all the stereotypes in the culture, uh, but mm. really allowing girls to be themselves, right? And and it's not it's not that these subjects are not right for girls. It's that girls can't see themselves. Um, in those subjects, right? So one of the, um, I'm going to skip to the next one, one of the uh, strategies that I think is most relevant and most helpful is bringing in role models uh, and helping mm -hmm. girls to see themselves in a STEM career, especially in computer science where we have such an issue right now. Um, and that's one way that girls can say, oh, oh here's a cool woman who's doing computer science. And I could do it also. So I, I think bringing in role models and examples, and as I said earlier, you know, making sure that the projects are relevant and letting girls choose them, that can make quite a difference for young women. Mm -hmm. um, I do have one resource I wanted to provide, um, and it's called the Fat Femmes Project, and this is an online database of role models. Uh, it's an international database. Uh, I put the link there on that slide, uh, and it's a place where role models can provide their information, tell their story, uh, programs can find role models who can either come and visit or are available on Skype, um, and parents and girls, of course, can uh, go to this website and read stories, and they can communicate with role models. And so here's a question for you. We monitor all of the emails that go back and forth between role models and girls. Um, and so I'm going to ask uh, all of you to guess what do you think uh, the most asked question is from girls to role models? Hmm. I, I don't know. <laughs> What kind of question might a girl ask a, ask a role model? You could just guess. Anybody can guess. 
How much Maybe. money do you make? <laughs> How much money do you make? No. That is not the most helpful <laughs> question. Are there maybe people in the chat are making suggestions? What are some other questions you think a girl might ask a role model? Hmm. What about what made you know you could do this? That's a great question, but that's not the most asked question. No, let's take let's do one more. One more guess. Um, we had an interview today with someone from Sydney University, uh, and that was from the, the Grok um, team, uh, Nikki Ringland. And the question one of the girls asked was, uh, uh, "Do you travel? Um, do you work from home? Um, uh, do you work as a part of a team?" Oh, that's a great question, but that's not the most asked question. Mm. Is it um, hard? Is it hard? Right. That that's a question, but it's not the most asked question. The most asked question that we see in the Fat Femmes database is, "What's your favorite color?" Ah, oh, I was going to ask that, but then I thought, no, just because I'm obsessed with blue, I won't ask questions. Like that. <laughs> that's hilarious. And right. what's the answer? Is it usually pink? Because I don't subscribe to that. <laughs> no, actually. It, you know, it's every color of the rainbow, right? But we have some of the our, our role models, they write us notes and say, I don't know how to answer this question because they're expecting all of those other questions that you listed, right? Um, yeah. And we say, you need to tell the girl your favorite color. My favorite color it's is... Yeah. Right, it's thing. Yeah. Right. And then the girl, and then ask the girl what's her favorite color. And it's just the way the conversation begins, right? So connection can be made. So what do you think the second the second most asked question is why do you like that color <laughs> yeah <laughs> no the second most asked question is do you have a pet ah, cool. yes yes and so so these are the ways that role models can connect with young girls and you know a girl will say wow you know if this woman has a favorite color and she has a pet and she's a scientist well maybe that's something I can do too I love it. Relatable. <laughs> yes, totally relatable. Sue's doing a wonderful job there, and you've got your seven different aspects of uh, ways of engaging girls in STEM there. And how did you come up with that uh, collection, Karen? Because that's a wonderful um, piece of scaffolding for me to hang on my classroom. Um, so. The way that we came up with that is when we were uh, producing the television series, and I had never been involved in any kind of media project before, um, we realized that it, was, it wasn't it was just a television show. It, it was also um, a resource for educators, right? And so we realized that we needed to create activities. And then we realized that it would be helpful to have some guidelines, right? And so, you know, SciGirl 7, that's kind of cool, right? It's not the SciGirls 8 or the SciGirls 5, right? And so um, we did quite a bit of research and listed all those strategies that are research-based that we know would be helpful to educators. And we've actually revised it several times. Uh, and it's been very helpful. They're tested. As I said, we have activities that are connected to all of them. And all you need to do is do a search, SciGirl 7, and you'll come across them. Uh, on the web. You'll also find all of the the um, episodes from all three seasons of Side Girls on YouTube. Uh, I learned today you can't get to uh, the PBS uh, episodes from Australia, but you can get to them on YouTube. Well, that's my uh, YouTube viewing with my daughter covered for at least a few days. <laughs> oh, it, yeah, you can do that for the next few months. Feel free. <laughs> So you also have um, a few other initiatives as well. So you've got the um, National Girls Collaborative. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, yes, I can. And um, actually, I'm going to pop up some slides for that as well. So let me go back to okay. sharing my screen, which hopefully I'll do correctly this time. All right, can you see my screen now? No, you still see my face. Still see you. Yeah. And it's Thank you. Here. We're switching to have a look at what Sue's up to there here. While you're uh, Fab Femmes, Sci Girl, Girls and STEM. That's going to be great to look back over at the end of this talk, Sue. I love all of the icons and pictures. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It really helps understand. 
It's like learning bling. Oh, I like that. Can you come to my classroom and do that during my lesson? <laughs> yes. You're much better yes, at drawing live than me. Okay, good. Yes. Done. Anyway, back to you, Karen. <laughs> to sure. the National Girls Collaborative Project. Yes, I'd love to tell you a little bit about the National Girls Collaborative Project. So um, we're really about connecting organizations together uh, so that they can help girls in STEM. And you know, as I do this work, sometimes I think that's a very simple concept, connecting folks together. And then there are other times when it feels very complex, right? Because it's hard to partner with somebody if you don't know them. Mm. So we, we began some time ago. Uh, we started with a small pilot project called the Northwest Girls Collaborative Project. And when I tell the story about how we began, I often say, you know, we were in a dark and rainy city where people drink lots of coffee. Seattle. And uh, we were... Yeah. Oh, same thing. Yeah, uh, and we, were, we were trying to um, come up with an idea for a program to engage girls in technology. And we decided to do a needs analysis. And so we talked to all of these educators that were writing programs for girls to see where the gaps were. And what we discovered was that many of these educators felt isolated. They weren't connected to business and industry. They weren't connected to higher education. And so we created this network, this framework, called the Northwest Girls Collaborative Project, funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, and then as we made presentations about this framework and network we had created, we had people from other states come up to us and say, hey, we need that in our state. And so we were uh, lucky enough to receive another uh, grant, a three-year grant from the National Science Foundation. And we uh, replicated our project in California, Massachusetts, and Wisconsin. Um, and that's where we really designed the collaboration model that we still use today. Um, and then we received a five-year grant to expand to 20 states, uh, and, uh, and now we're on a second five-year grant uh, that's really based on looking back at all of our work uh, and thinking about, you know, what is it that we're doing well and where are areas that we could improve. And so our current uh, five-year grant is focused on uh, serving more girls of color, girls with disability, and working with school counselors. And so these are really our project goals to maximize access to shared resources. You know, we had heard from educators about all the wonderful resources they knew were out there, but they didn't have time to find them. So we identify those resources and practices. Psych Girl 7 is a great example, and share that across our network. Uh, we also strengthen the capacity of existing programs because we know from um, 10 years of evaluation data that if a program is strong, if it's effective and efficient, that benefits girls. And then ultimately, we want to collaborate to create that tipping point for gender equity in STEM. So this is just a few terms that I use from time to time when I talk about NGCP uh, so that folks uh, know exactly what I'm referring to. A collaborative is a state or regional network. A convening organization is the lead organization that manages the leadership team. And so, for example, in Texas, that's the University of Texas at Austin. In New York, it's the Intrepid Museum. And we have a wide range of convening organizations that are leading the work across the United States. A leadership team, that's a group of people that really lead the work of that collaborative across the state. Uh, our model is uh, well connected to collective impact. And so uh, we actually have sort of a list that we give our leadership teams of all the different stakeholder groups that they need to involve so that they can be effective. And then each collaborative has a champions board, which is really a high level advisory board that champions the project. And this is a map of where we have existing collaboratives. We're in 40 states, uh, the green states. And the blue states um, are not necessarily part of our network in an organized way, but we do serve the entire United States. So hopefully via our online resources, um, they're able to access uh, all of our services. This is just a cool um, animation that we put together uh, that shows sort of the growth of the National Girls Collaborative Project across the United States. Is that animation showing up in the Hangout? Yeah, yeah, it is. Cool. Oh, very I cool. See, 
I can almost say the Mississippi was the last to be uh, collaborative. <laughs> That's true. All right. Um, and this is just a list of all the activities, the services we provide that virtually we have a website. We have something called the Connectory, which is an online database of programs. We have FAPFEMS. I mentioned that earlier. We do a newsletter. Uh, we uh, send out a lot of information via social media. And then we do webinars. Uh, we've got about 45 archived webinars. We tend to do them almost uh, every other month or so where we bring in speakers and uh, provide information. So it depends on what's happening uh, in, the, in the STEM and girls and equity world. And mm -hmm. then locally in each of our states, they provide conferences and forums, professional development. They have mini grant money that incentivizes programs to work together. And they also have newsletters and local resources. Um, this just shows our impact. Oh, you know, we've been around for a long time, so we've got some big numbers in terms of the programs that we're serving and the participants that have been in our mini grants. Um, lots of visits to our website. Uh, almost 20,000 practitioners have been served through our events and webinars, and that we're serving 16 million girls um, by working with uh, educators that serve those girls. And, you know, we serve almost 9 million boys because many of the programs that are focused on girls also serve boys. And, yeah. you know, we know that all of these strategies work for boys as well. Karen, Karen, do you think the concept of a collaborative would work in the Australian environment? Definitely. I definitely do because I think that um, you have you know similar issues and barriers for girls in STEM. I know you're very collaborative here in Australia and what we found is that our collaboration model, um, it's, it's not content specific, it's more about helping people work together and, and partner and um, you have some geographical challenges here that you know I think collaboration could assist you with. So Karen, um, you must have collected quite a few um, amazing examples and stories um, of your of your time in terms of the people that you've connected and the impact that you're making on girls and their futures. Is there maybe a couple that really stand out to you that you'd like to share? Yeah, I actually have one story I love to tell. It is one of our first uh, mini grants that we gave. Um, we had talked to some amazing female scientists or female engineers at Boeing, and they were women of color, mm -hmm. and they they were very excited. They wanted to mentor girls. They wanted girls to come to the Boeing plant and see them building airplanes. But they, they didn't know how to find girls. They, didn't, they even said to me, where are they? Where are the girls? Um, and, and so at one of our collaborative events, the girls, um, uh, the, a program leader for girls in rural Washington state, and so these were Latinas, um, she met these female Boeing engineers. And you know one of the things that we do in our events is to help people connect with each other. We do something called collaboration networking. And so through that collaboration networking, those female engineers connected with this program leader and said, wow, we really want your girls to come to the Boeing plan. Now, if you think about parents of young girls, they're not going to just send their girls off across the state right? <laughs> yeah. to meet some female engineers, no matter how well-meaning they are. And um, But this program leader could go back to the parents and say, I have this great idea, right, for this overnight trip. And with just a little bit of money to use for transportation and um, staying overnight, that program leader brought those young Latinas to the Boeing plant where they met with these female engineers and saw planes being built. And, you know, one of the great stories that comes out of that example is that one of those girls looked up and said, I didn't know girls could build airplanes. She never could have imagined, right, that that was a future, right? And here was a, you know, a, a Latina engineer who looked like her, right, saying, "You could do this. This is something that you could do." So I, you know, I have many stories like that about people making connections and then really be, being able to expand 
um, access for girls instead. I, I was wondering, perhaps, uh, Karen, how important is it for the um, real-world connections to the success or even the parent perceptions that they might pass on to the girls? It's, it's, it's very important. Um, that's one reason why I recommend role models, right, so that girls can hear those stories. But the, the real, world piece, real world piece of it is very inspiring. And, you know, one of the reasons I talked about Psy Girls is because Psy Girls uh, uses real world problems. You know, girls are solving problems from their community. So bringing in community issues can be very engaging for girls and help them see that uh, there's a future for them you know, in the STEM career. I guess, uh, well, thank you. Um, I was wondering um, if I can jump ahead a minute, if I can ask this question about um, our school. Our school is currently um, starting a STEM program of studies for the uh, girls at Year 9 and some exciting ideas and things are looking at uh, building into the program. Um, I was wondering, Karen, what your advice be for schools looking to start a STEM program? Um, where would they start and what are the key principles that they need to consider? Right. So, you know, I would say one of the most important things would be to really uh, make a connection to the community, right? Because, you know, we me I mentioned that girls need to find projects that are personally relevant, right? So, um, you know, of course, strong content is important. And, of course, you need educators that know about engaging girls in STEM. But I think, you know, having um, projects that are connected to the community and also making sure that you involve families, um, you know, not just parents but the entire family, so that uh, the messaging that the girl hears in the school in the school continues when she's at home. Mm. Thank you. Karen, Karen one of the things that, that um, I think lots of people wonder about is if you're going to look after girls in STEM, do they have to be on their own or can boys and girls be um, in the same room doing STEM together, you know, what's the relationship between the boys and the girls and the numbers when you when you have mixed groups and, and you're trying to do things? Yeah, that you know, that's a great question. That, that question gets asked a lot because we know that boys and girls learn differently, can learn differently, and uh, there are times when boys and girls are in the same classroom that maybe the girl's learning experience is not what it should be, right? Um, however, uh, there are ways that educators can really uh, make sure that they're calling on boys and girls equally, and that especially in groups, right, that um, the girl has, the girls take turns, the, all of the students take turns so that uh, if there's a specific role they're playing, everybody gets to play that role. Because there's actually research that shows that Often girls end up with the job of secretary, right? Taking notes. Um, and so educators really have to be aware of that in mixed gender classrooms, uh, that the girls have just as much hands-on experience and time. Um, there was a study, it's a very old study, where uh, researchers sat in classrooms and counted how many times teachers called on boys versus girls. And you know, th these were great teachers, um, and the teachers called on boys uh, three times more than girls. Uh, and if you, when you talk to teachers about that with that information, they could not believe it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. it, they didn't believe that they were doing that. Uh, it was a, it was very subtle, and one of the reasons is that you know boys are uh, waving their hands more yeah. often, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. me, me, me. Um, and so teachers respond to that, right? And so thinking about those sorts of um, strategies and just be, raising awareness, right, around that and making sure that all students have um, equal access uh, can, can mean that a mixed gender classroom is a positive environment for a girl. Um, but there are, you know, there are some times when having an all-girl environment 
um, can be helpful to girls because then they don't have to navigate or negotiate those issues with boys. So often um, I get asked to answer that question and the, I think the answer people want me to give is an all girls environment is better. Uh, but it, it's, you know, it's not a zero sum game, right? Sometimes it's better and sometimes it's not. So it's really more about the educator. Just like, yeah. you know, we're not going to say that a female teacher is better for a girl, right? It, you know, uh, there are many girls that have been inspired to go into STEM because of their father or because of a, a male mentor or because of a male teacher. Yep, and I guess it's that um, consistent message that they, they can do it and their ideas and their contributions and their roles are really worthwhile in that mix as well. And exactly. certainly personally, <clears throat> I've um, as well as often getting the secretary role, <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've often found that sometimes I, um, in in some situations, I can work better as a as a girl. I worked better with boys because you know I knew that they're just going to focus on it, and I was really interested in what they were doing, and um, that was a good fit. But then other times, it wasn't always the case. So. Yeah, it's very interesting to hear your reflections. And I'm no. interested to hear with some of the different strategies that you've suggested so far about how to increase the confidence that the girls have in their abilities. I'm sorry, if they have or have they increased confidence? In their abilities. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, you know, especially giving girls uh, opportunities for open-ended projects, right? Um, and we have a number of research projects in the U.S. Uh, with information that has shown that if a girl has more control over her learning and over the choices of projects, um, she's going to be more successful and she's more inclined to choose STEM careers. And a, a good example of that is um, sometimes projects that are chosen by teachers might be really sports oriented, right? Or orient, oriented towards something that a girl isn't necessarily interested in, right? So, I mean, I gave a talk once and several teachers came up to me and said, so I can't use sports as an example. And I'm like, no, it's just that you can't use sports all the time, right? You have to have a wide range interdisciplinary topics and thinking about all of your students because you can't assume that all boys are interested in sports either, right? So, um, so we do have data that shows that if, if girls have a wide range of choices, if they have control, and then if that educator is sort of guiding, right, making sure, again, that the girl doesn't end up with a secretary role. Um, and, and actually, we know that all of these strategies, they help boys as well. As I said earlier, they're just great teaching strategies. But sometimes if girls are note-taking, they do amazing jobs as well, like Sue's collaborative, uh, collaborative, <laughs> very beautiful and artistic right. whiteboard, visual notes. Isn't it great? <laughs> I'm looking forward to the high res zoomed in version later as well. I'm sure we can add a link to it as well. <laughs> so Karen, you also um, mentioned you have another initiative called the Connectory. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that is and what it's trying to achieve? Yes, definitely. And uh, you can visit that at theconnectory.org. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another international database. So, you know, when I told you that story about how the National Girls Collaborative Project began, you know, one of the things that people asked us is, is there a list of girls serving STEM programs? And, you know, if you looked at the dates of when we began, it was actually before Google. <laughs> so, you couldn't find um, all of the girls serving STEM programs in any one place. So we created this database. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's more than a database. It also asks programs to list their needs and their resources and their collaboration interests. Um, so it's sort of like a match.com, right, for programs. Um, yeah. Because you can go in there and say, you know, I, I'm looking for curriculum or I want to connect with girls that are interested in STEM opportunities. And so the Connectory provides that sort of collaboration 
matching, as well as providing a list. And if you go to the connectory.org, the main page is really set up for parents. Uh, it locates opportunities in your zip code, and I don't think we have any Australian programs or opportunities, so if you go there, you're not necessarily going to see a list, but if you put in a, an American zip code, you'll get a list. Right, right now, we have uh, about 4,500 uh, programs uh, in the connector, mostly American, even though it is an international database, we're just starting to uh, talk to other countries about entering their programs. So it works for parents, it's a great collaboration tool for educators, um, and we're continuing to build it. We're um, adding more features uh, quarterly. We just recently um, add, added some additional collaboration interest you know, based on what people told us they wanted. Uh, last year we added DIY making. We did not have, I can't even believe it now, that we did not have making as a content area. And so we have a great partnership with MakerEd. And uh, they're, we created DIY making as a field, and they're recruiting as many uh, maker programs as possible to get into the connectory. Now, speaking, for, uh, speaking of making as well, you were sharing uh, before we went um, live to our broadcast that there's this different acronym usually go with STEM or STEAM, but you came up with E-STEAM, and it's got a few extra letters, so it's E-S-T-E-A-M-M-E. -E -E. Do you want to tell us what that stands for? Actually, I want Lindy to tell you what that stands for. Oh, Lindy, go for it. That's Lindy's brainchild. Oh, well, credit to Lindy okay. then. Okay. Yes. Esteem. <laughs> Esteem. When we were looking at girls, especially in rural, regional, and remote communities, we thought that 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 adds another layer of complexity because a lot of times those girls have much less access to programs just by the geography of their remoteness mm -hmm. and that there's fewer things happening in small towns or in remote communities than there are in cities and peri-urban areas. So we, we tried to think what are some of the contexts in which STEM can happen that would break down some of the silos between the letters and then working with Sue has really brought home to us the really interesting ways that the arts can be used to communicate science. And so we started to think about um, the things like hackerspaces and startups and shark tanks and those kind of entrepreneurship weekends and how much STEM comes into all of those. And then we thought about maker spaces and the whole concept of maker education because I'd just come back from the States where I was working with a group called Tabletop Inventing and they tow around behind a, a, a mobile home a, a trailer that's filled with carts and on each cart is two um, 3D printers and then all of the Arduino gear or the Lego that you need and they just wheel them out plug them in and they instantly have a room full of maker equipment with 20 um, uh, 3D printers and, and 40 Arduinos and things like that. And we thought, well, maker education and entrepreneurship are the bookends. And when you use those strategies, you actually integrate all of the STEAM elements in, in a cross-disciplinary and transdisciplinary way because they provide context for content. So then we thought, well, what we're trying to do is actually raise girls' esteem because that's the most impactful thing. So it, okay. it has that double meaning. And so our project is actually called uh, Esteem and our hashtag is Esteem because we think that's the way to bring together all those different aspects. Nice, I like that. I'm just putting the full acronym. Is, the is there a danger sometimes though with the acronyms that we sometimes um, lose sight of the real mission, which is about developing the whole student, that we, we start making new silos or um, we, we fall behind the jargon? But really what we're dealing with is a good education and good pedagogy that um, levels the playing field and make sure that it's equitable to all students. And it's relevant too with uh, the current kind of blended learning imperatives that we have. 
Well, I agree with that. And in fact, if you if you look at the Side Girl Seven, I mean, you see you see good teaching, right? You see good facilitation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we could like not call it. In fact, we could look at Sue's board, right? Collaboration, personally relevant, open-ended, hands-on, right? Uh, positive feedback. That's just good teaching. So I, I, you know, I agree. Sometimes I think, you know, a new trendy thing comes along and it's got a cool acronym and everyone's talking about it and um, really looking at um, much more critically about. So what is it about? You know, what what is the strategy? What is this really about? It might serve us better. But lots of you know people are interested in what's new and shiny, right? Mm. It, it, and, and the other thing I like too, Karen, is that you've actually got some really good research that underpins what it is you're doing. Um, this isn't just something you feel good about um, or that you um, have just thought through. Um, this is something that's actually based on some really solid yes. research about how kids learn. It is, exactly. And we actually, if you go to the website, we have a much longer version of the Cyber 7 that that has uh, the exact research that it's based on, and then additional readings, and we update that every few years. In fact, I think it's time for us to do another update because even though we've got some great research and there's, you know, some of it's 2002, 2004, it's time to update those citations, and new research is coming out all the time. And, and that's what's got me curious. Um, where do you think that there's some scope that, that we could be conducting research? That some of the questions that we could be asking, mm -hmm. that we need to sort of um, help reveal. I actually think that there's um, quite a bit that we could do right now around um, uh, mindset, you know, Carol Dweck's work um, around um, mindset. I think actually that, I mean, that research is really accessible, but I don't think we're really uh, talking to teachers in classrooms about how they're applying that. So it's not just professional development, but it's also um, looking more at attribution theory and the way that students learn in classrooms. I think that would be great. I also I also think um, there, there's a lot of opportunity right now to do research around collaboration and technology. You know, a lot happened many, many years ago, right? But I think um, technology has changed so much now that we could look at how uh, children work in groups, you know, using certain types of technology and see what's most effective. That that's just that's just my opinion. <laughs> Jason's smiling. He's always got a good research question at this point. Sue, oh, sorry, Karen. Um, yes. Do you see a difference between uh, science and mathematics and computer science? Uh, computer science doesn't seem to have shifted in terms of girls' participation. Um, are you seeing any significant differences between the two in your programs? And are you seeing any success in engaging girls with computer science um, beyond their teenage years? So you're right. Computer science is, is a big problem. And it's, it's one of our largest problems for engaging girls. I have hope. I have a lot of hope that it's going to get better because there's such a focus on it now. Um, we're working with Google on a number of initiatives, and um, they're investing quite a bit in helping girls uh, get excited via coding. There's something Google is doing called Made with Code. Um, in fact, I think you have, um, you have a magazine here uh, in Australia that's recently come out that's uh, all about coding that uh, was put together to attract young people to go into computer science. So I have hope, uh, but a lot has to do around stereotypes and sort of, I mean, if you if you probably, if you asked a seventh grade girl what does a computer programmer do, you know, she'd probably say, you know, sits in a dark room with a monitor, you know, doesn't talk to anybody. I mean, we still, if we do the, you know, draw scientist or draw computer engineer, we still get uh, drawings of men with crazy hair, right, <laughs> with glasses, right? Um, so we really have to do a lot to change the image of computing uh, in order to attract more young women uh, before it's going to get any better. But I have hope because there's so many initiatives going on right now. Uh, I think it's going to take a while, though, for that pathway to fill up. And then we need corporations to do their part, right? And to make sure that the environment is is friendly. 
right? And that we don't get the chilly climate that we used to have in the past where women would go into those fields, engineering, for example, and then they would leave after a few years because it wasn't a positive environment for them. Thank you, Karen. Um, I wonder if it's this point to have a cross to Sue who can summarize the graphic. She's been happily penciling away in the background and I uh, just wonder if she can give us a visual story tell. <coughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> talking, that's great. Uh, well, I think it, I mean, Karen's presentation was wonderful and um, basically what I've tried to do here is curls in STEM. Can you see that? I don't know what you can see, sorry. Yeah. It looks um, great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so starting with the SciGirl 7 as an excellent example of teaching strategies for both girls and boys. So it's not just all about the girls, it's about the boys too. And what Karen was mentioning, it's all really about the equity in the classroom, that everyone's called upon, etc. And then these are the, the seven strategies uh, ranging from you know, collaboration, making sure that things are personally relevant, um, projects are open-ended and hands-on. I really like that visual of hands-on, see my hands. Um, <laughs> I'm very, I'm Italian, this is what happens. Um, also that projects are done in their own way and they can be creative, I really love that obviously. Um, positive feedback in a constructive way, to be able to think critically is also another one of the strategies. And um, my favourite um, is about role models and mentors. Um, I think that everybody, no matter if you're a boy or a girl, can really benefit from that. Uh, then um, basically Karen went on to her amazing programs, which is not only the National Girls Collaborative Project, which connects all across the United States, I mean, basically more than Australia in terms of um, land mass. Um, and then looking at some of the, just a really key snapshot of the model activities, whether or not they're virtual through websites, Fab Fems, online directory, through to local activities of conferences and mini grants, right through to that the National Girls Collaborative Project is actually serving 16 million girls. And do I need to say any more, really? No, but I will. Um, and then we talked about Fab Fems being the online directory with mentors, of which I'm one. Very excited, one of two in Australia. That's two. Um, and also, we'll get the, more. Whole, the whole, um, basically, visual story today is it, not only is it focusing on girls in STEM, but I, you know, I was once young and with boys and girls in schools, and I do think that these strategies apply across the board. It's not just about the girls, but Wearing pink today for girls, um, it's just a, a really nice way of um, including girls in STEM or STEAM or STEAM. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm really excited that we could have you as uh, a very first live uh, visual note taker. It's really exciting. It's delightful. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's high pressure, I'm sure. And you did use some blue for me, so that's good too. <laughs> and I'd recommend anybody to actually check out uh, the website. You've got a blog, and Sue, I know you've got a collection of your wonderful artwork online. Do you want to, want to repeat your address again so our listeners can go uh, there? Yeah. My website is www.drsuepillens.com, um, and if you wanted to follow my alter ego, Dr. Susie Starfish, on, on Facebook as well. Lovely. It's been a wonderful hangout tonight. I've learned heaps and uh, my experience teaching in a uh, girls' school, wonderful school, Marta Christie in uh, Belgrave, is that um, even as an educator with uh, 20 plus years of uh, teaching in science and technology, I've had a lot to learn uh, about how to engage the girls in my classroom and how to inspire them to be valuable members of our community. And it really was just about um, many of the things that I'm reading here and I've learned a lot of new things. So thank you very much for sharing them, Lindy and Karen. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. We we're really appreciate having some airtime and some fun and trying a first. Yes. <laughs> Love it. And I must say, Lindy, um, I'm watching here lots of Twitter notifications of the um, the ESTEAM acronym. Just people loving that, retreating that one. <laughs> yeah. So lots of um, so lots of them in my stream here and. From people I don't know, but um, there's some Microsoft educators who've picked it up and I really like it. Excellent. Well, um, it must be that we're all connecting through that one idea. So expanding our connections for collaboration, so we can build our esteem as well. <laughs> yeah. 
Agreed. In closing up, is there anything anyone else would like to add, just reflecting um, on what has been shared this evening? Karen. Yes. If teachers would like to uh, follow up on the uh, work by the uh, group uh, from Australia, um, all the information on the website, maybe you'd like to give us a plug about the SciGirl 7 website and... Yes, so um, there's actually there's actually a, a SciGirlsConnect.org uh, mm -hmm. is a great website where uh, you join and then you have access. It's free. It's all free. You have access to all of the activity guides and um, all of the information that you can um, download and use in your classroom or in your program. And then I mentioned that all of the SciGirls episodes are on, I think it's YouTube slash SciGirls as well. And uh, folks can reach out to me. Uh, my email address is on the National Girls Collaborative Project website. I'm happy to make any sorts of connections. You know, I think your, your lead collaborator here in Australia is Lindy. So she's the best person to reach out to as well. But she's amazing. Um, she is amazing, and I'm just having the best time following her around. Actually, uh -huh. and, uh, so much great work is happening here in Australia. I'm really pleased to uh, be talking with all of you today on this hangout. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Thank you, and uh, Lindy. Well, it's been a pleasure traveling around with Karen and I felt it was my duty to show her some of the cool places while she was here. So we've been out to regional Toowoomba, we've taken her up to Rainbow Beach and shown her um, the Australian surf and the beaches, taken her um, into the city in Brisbane and seen the New World City as Derek Bartels would call it. <laughs> and so, um, we're, we're going to continue that tour. We're off. Uh, we're in Ipswich tonight, thanks courtesy of Michelle Williams and Paul Sutton, who are great, <laughs> great educators um, in their own right. And uh, we're going to call in and see the Ipswich um, animals tomorrow. We're in the park where they've got the koalas and kangaroos. So have that encounter with our marsupials tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Amanda. Well, I really um, have loved the discussion this evening, and and what I've loved is it's not just been a, you know, here's the latest token you can do to uh, attract girls. That it's all been about um, good teaching practice and the idea of connecting with others, the importance of relationships and those real world connections, and there's something that can be uh, applied no matter what your gender is, but I really love that you're showcasing to young girls the the possible futures and the ways that women are already contributing within the fields of science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And it's just been um, really great to meet you. So thank you, Lindy, for introducing us and for um, saying, hey, we all need to hang out. That's just been really <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> And so next um, week we've actually got another hangout. I know we've been slack recently, but we're going to do two in a row, and um, we're following up with another um, ACCE 2016 um, keynote, Dr. Michael Henderson, or is it Associate Professor now or something like that? Very fancy. Uh, definitely, Dr. Um, so he can go. Associate yes. Professor. Associate Professor, lovely. And so we'll be talking about some of the things that he is going to be sharing and challenging us with at the amazing Australian Educators Conference for Australian Educators by Australian Educators. Lots of great practice and research to be shared at that event. Um, and if you have any future suggestions for our show, please let us know. And you can view all of our past recordings on the ACCE LN YouTube channel as well. And we're really glad you could join us and look forward to seeing you next time. Bye, Certainly. Everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you later. Bye, everyone. <laughs>